Hi, my name is Dr. Suk Lee Liu. I'm an assistant professor and the director of the Neuroplasticity and Neurorehabilitation Lab at the University of Southern California. Today, it's my honor to talk to you guys about reproducibility and rehabilitation research and how data science and open science can help. So when we talk about scientific reproducibility and replicability, there are a few different things uh, that it means. Reproducibility specifically refers to the ability for someone or even yourself to reproduce an experimental paradigm. Um, so that means, for instance, if you read a paper, is there sufficient detail in that paper for you to implement the same experiment? Or is it more like the cartoon on the right here, where you have some steps that are in great detail, and then there's a missing step that seems pretty critical for you to be able to or reproduce the same experiment. In contrast, replicability is the ability for someone or yourself to obtain consistent results given the same experiment. So if I did the same experiment three times, replicability would be getting the same results each three of those three times. These are both generally referred to as reproducibility sometimes in the literature. Um, and it's because right now there's a lot of attention on what's called the reproducibility crisis. The reproducibility crisis is the fact that so many scientists have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. Um, so one report from Nature said that over 70% of scientists have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. Uh, in the field of psychology specifically, they set out to replicate 100 different studies and they were only able to successfully replicate the results of 39. Um, and this actually is something that probably isn't news to many people. Um, I think there's a lot of research also, even within rehabilitation, that shows that when we try to reproduce or replicate results um, that have been published previously, a lot of times this isn't possible. So what are some factors that contribute to this problem? Well, for one, there's methods. So uh, there's, I think, an underutilization of reproducible methods and that means that there are a lot of things that are still being done that are manual, for instance, data entry um, and even data analysis. You might run an analysis um, in your uh, analytic program of choice. Maybe it's SPSS or Excel or something, but you might make different changes and assumptions to the statistics that you're running. You might add or remove covariates. You might change the data source. Um, and if that isn't all kept in a clear record, then it's very possible for there to be errors in how this is done. Also, in most teams, there's more than one person working on a study, and so inconsistent record keeping across different team members can also contribute um, to a lack of consistency in how it's done, and then a lack of consistency in the reporting, um, which would make it uh, reproducible for other people. In addition, when it comes to the results, I think replicability is a huge problem. Like we mentioned before, even if you can reproduce the same experiment, you may not get the same results. Um, and that really comes down to a few main factors. Uh, one is the positive publication bias that many of you have probably heard of, uh, which is just the fact that papers tend to be published when they have a significant positive result um, versus publishing null results, which is a lot more challenging. Um, and this is also due, I think, to logistical limitations. So a small sample, um, maybe you have limited time or money or the participants that you're trying to recruit are really difficult um, to recruit. And so the sample may be underpowered, but if the sample tends to show positive results, then this is more likely to be published than a sample um, that is the same size and maybe also underpowered, but shows null results. So what can we do about these two factors? Well, today I'm going to briefly uh, argue that for methods and talking about reproducibility, we can take a lot of tools that have been gained from data science and use them to help address some of these issues and create more reproducible methods. And then in contrast, for replicability, I think open science is a great way to kind of get around some of these barriers of sample size and also publication bias by pooling together data sets, whether they've been published or unpublished, so that we have a larger and more diverse sample size and sample set to use. In terms of the first part, which is reproducibility, I really think data science offers a lot of amazing um, tools that we can use in our rehabilitation research today uh, in order to make sure that the way that we're doing the results or the way that we're doing our experiments can be used and re reproduced uh, 
both within our labs and beyond our labs. So this looks like things including data management using consistent formatting. Um, what that really means is saving your files in a way that is consistent and also machine readable. Um, so it has the same number of digits per file name, the file folders have the same structure, etc. And doing that, even though it sounds really simple and uh, kind of like nitpicky, it ends up being something that will really make your research a lot more reproducible because then you can use um, executable scripts and computer programming to do your data analysis. Um, and a benefit of this, whether your data analysis is in MATLAB or R or Python, is that you keep track in these scripts of all the variables and all the assumptions that you made. Um, you also keep track of the data source that you used to input into your analysis code. Um, and this helps it to be a lot more reproducible in the long run so that if you revisit your experiment 10 years later, you should still be able to run the same analysis and get the same results. Uh, in addition, there's tools like GitHub or other version control softwares that will allow you to keep track of the analyses and also of the data across um, different team members and across different analyses. And the end goal of using all of these tools from data science is ultimately to create what we call reproducible papers. So my background is in neuroimaging. Um, and I have been actively following and involved in a lot of reproducible neuroimaging method, uh, methods and consortiums. Um, for instance, there's the Center for Reproducible Neuroimaging, or ReproNIM, uh, and they have a ton of resources for each of these steps. So how do we manage our data? How do we analyze the data? And how can we create ultimately reproducible papers? At a high level, I think this is a great example of what a reproducible paper could look like. This is a paper published by my colleague Anisha Keshavan, and I love it because she not only published it in a traditional journal in a traditional format, but she also put it online. And because her results um, and her analysis code were all computer generated, um, you can actually interact with the code and the analyses, and you can look at specific data points in a way that's so much more powerful than I think a traditional static paper. Um, and she actually even made the code to create this paper freely available online as well. So all of her code, all of her data, and all of her analysis code, and all of the reproducible paper code um, can be found uh, on GitHub. And so I think that's a really valuable um, tool because it means that you're not just doing the analysis once, but you can actually pass your code to someone else. They can do the analysis. They could do the exact same analysis with their own data set, um, et cetera. Okay. In terms of rehab research specifically, I think there's a ton of resources for data science and this is continuing to grow. Um, so there are centers that are supported um, by the NIH, for instance, the Mobilized Center at Stanford, the Center for Large Data Research and Data Sharing and Rehabilitation. Um, in 2019, uh, some colleagues and I gave a symposium at the American Society for Neurorehabilitation uh, annual meeting, and it was on reliability and reproducibility for neurorehab research. Um, and we covered uh, the basics of Python, R, and MATLAB for reproducible research. And we actually made those slides and code available on GitHub as well. Um, so everything is freely available for you to look at yourself. Um, and then from the neuroimaging community, there's a lot of great resources because there's been a lot of push for reproducibility. Um, and using kind of data science tools to organize and manage and analyze data. Um, and I think a lot of those tools can also be extracted uh, and extrapolated to rehab research. So ReproNIM has a website, like I mentioned, that has great um, course curricula for how to do reproducible analyses, basics of coding, et cetera. And Neuro Academy also this year went virtual, so they have YouTube videos of all sorts of videos, uh, including how to use GitHub, how to use Docker, how to use Python, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, I think when you're just starting out learning data science, there's some pretty basic resources that are available for free or low cost on things like Coursera or Udemy. So I think there's a lot of different online resources right now that people can take advantage of to start using data science for rehab research. In terms of reliability and the results in getting over things like pub positive publication bias and logistical limitations, this is where I think open science really comes into play. Um, so this is the idea of using either retrospective data sets that have been archived or pooled samples that you combine data from different either retrospective or prospectively collect together data sets across diverse research sites. 
Um, or there could be large perspective data collections within one site that you could use. But in general, sharing data and making data publicly available, I think is a very powerful tool so that you can test hypotheses in samples that are much larger um, than, that are much larger than you might otherwise expect. Okay. Um, so open science, in terms of generally what it is, uh, the open science movement is the idea of sharing published and unpublished data, code, or protocols, or even resources um, so that other people and other scientists can benefit from them. Uh, there's a lot of push to do it, mostly because it can help to improve the scientific reproducibility and replicability of our studies, but it also builds capacity in the scientific community, and especially for trainees who maybe don't have their own data yet. Um, it's an opportunity for them to use existing data, analyze it and reanalyze it, and learn how to um, apply methods to existing data sets. Um, in order to access open data sets, it's usually free to download. Um, there is usually some agreement that you won't abuse or sell the data, and then that's it. So um, I think they're a great resource. There are tons of types of open data sets out there, and I think that this is hopefully growing too as more awareness comes to the power of sharing our data. Um, so data types include survey data, behavioral measures, demographics, kinematic data, video data, physiological data, like brain imaging, um, et cetera. And even like health services, medical records um, can be openly searched online now. Um, of course, all of these sources are de-identified or anonymized to protect participant privacy. Um, but there are just so many options and ways that we can test our um, hypotheses in data sets that are maybe larger than what we could collect individually on our own. I also will distinguish between prospective data collection, where the protocol is usually set prior to the data collection. Um, that's like a, maybe several sites agree to collect the same data versus retrospective data archives. And this is usually study specific data. And after a group finishes doing a study and they publish it, they might choose to archive that data so other people could access it later. In terms of rehabilitation related data archives, um, many of these are funded by NCMRR. So like I mentioned before, the Center for Large Data Research and Data Sharing and Rehabilitation has tons of different types of health services research data and retrospective study-specific data from rehabilitation studies. Um, they also partner with the um, ICPSR and the ADDEP, which is the Archive of Data on Disability to Enable Policy and Research. Um, and again, this are also archives of retrospective study-specific rehab data. And these are often really rich data sets um, because they ask a lot of questions um, and you can go back and analyze them for your own study purposes. Uh, there's also OpenSim, which is a free motion simulation toolbox, and it provides a lot of trained models that people have generated using uh, motion simulation parameters so you can apply it to different populations. There are also, like I said, again, my background is in brain imaging, so I am more familiar with brain imaging resources, but there are also many clinical and behavioral um, data sets available. So um, these are a few of them. For instance, the Human Connectome Project is an amazing uh, large effort to collect brain imaging and clinical and behavioral data um, in a lot of different large populations. So there's lifespan data, um, there's data just in people that are young adults, there's data people aging, there's clinical populations, and then it has behavior that corresponds to the brain imaging. Uh, many of you may also have heard of the UK Biobank. So this is a, um, an effort from the UK to collect health records data, including brain imaging, genetics, and clinical variables for up to 100,000 individuals. Uh, and then more recently, the U.S. has launched an All of Us initiative. So this is where uh, U.S. health records data, which also includes brain imaging, genetics, clinical variables, and questionnaires that people are asked to fill out if they are willing to, um, become, will become released. And so you, I think you can already sign up to use it, or you should be able to soon, um, and you can access data as it comes in. And the goal for all of us is to get to 1 million individuals. Um, so that will be a really rich and diverse data set that you could test hypotheses with. Um, there's also community-specific types of data um, sources. So uh, like I said, since my background's in brain imaging, there's a, a few sources that are just for brain imaging 
um, data analysis and data sharing. So Open Neuro has, I think, over 370 MRI, MEG, EEG, or ECOG data sets. Uh, there's also the International Neuroimaging Data Sharing in Initiative, where people are sharing all different types of data, uh, MRI, fMRI, diffusion, et cetera, that they've been collecting. And then there's also Nitric, which is an NIH-funded resource um, that has not only data, but also tons of software, tools, and atlases that you could access. Um, so these are just a few examples of open data sources that you could use to test hypotheses um, or to look at covariates or to try to diversify your data questions. Uh, so a little while ago, we did also a webinar for um, ASNR where we talked again about open data and what types of things people would want to access within the rehab community. And I tweeted it out and the responses that I got, I thought I could just kind of find sources for people that they were looking for. Uh, but the responses ended up being pretty specific uh, and things that really aren't widely available publicly, I would say. So, um, for instance, they wanted resting EEG with motor learning data specifically, um, and it should be collected before the motor learning uh, or myelin water fraction MRI with clinical behavior. Um, so for this type of thing, if your desire is data that's a little bit more specific, um, then I would highly recommend collaborative data sharing. Um, so that's something that I think is happening a lot right now, especially since many of us can't uh, actively collect data or there are restrictions on collecting data. So if you have a specific need, you could consider reaching out to somebody with a published data set that you'd like to utilize. Um, there are some general guidelines, including collaborating on the data, so not just asking for the data set, but also inviting the person who has the data to uh, be one of the authors, because I think they'll also provide you with insight on the data and how to use it, um, and insight on some of the nuances of the data that may not have been published. Um, and then another thing you can do is help to organize their data, for instance, into a data archive that you could both publish. So for instance, when you archive data and you make it publicly available, you can publish it as a data report um, in journals like Scientific Data or Giga Science, or I think Frontiers also has one as well. Um, that becomes a citation and it also becomes an amazing resource for the community. Um, if you are listening to this and you think we have so much data and I'd love to be able to share it, I really encourage you to do that. Um, first of all, I think at this point, you know, this is a great time to be thinking about data sharing. Um, in some cases, you may want to make sure that your IRB protocol and consent has language for sharing de-identified data. So we do have that as part of all of our protocols that say, um, I agree, or I understand that my data will be de-identified and shared publicly with other people. Um, it's also a good time to learn about good data management practices because when you share it, um, maybe people don't necessarily want just a giant data dump, but it's nice when your data is logically organized and someone can come into it and know exactly what's there. Um, you can also apply for a CLDR rehabilitation specific data sharing grant to cover some of the time and effort that it will take to archive existing data. And really what's involved is um, organizing your data in a way that other people can understand, creating a metadata file that explains what the variables are, what the levels of the variables are, et cetera. Um, and then just making sure that everything is there and in place. Um, you can also learn more about FAIR principles and reproducible methods for open science on the ReproNum page. Um, and this is basically like how to organize your data and also what are principles that support open science. Um, and then I'm also always available, so I'm happy to discuss if you're interested in archiving or sharing your data. Um, I highly encourage that because I think this is open data and data science, I think are gonna be two ways that we can really move the field forward that kind of augment the things that a lot of researchers are already doing and will just help to enhance and extend the impact of our work. So thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. <laughs>